Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to you all for, and thank you for joining us here. And also a warm welcome to our audience watching us live on weforum.org. This is the second issue briefing of a packed afternoon schedule. Um, we've already just been hearing about financial growth and social inclusion in the Arab world, so a subtle um, yeah, change of, of uh, subject matter here. But of course, all related to the unofficial theme of the meeting, which is the fourth industrial revolution. How much? I'm not sure yet, but let's find out. This is about the sustainable development goals. I'm going to keep my time talking to a limited uh, time as possible. It's a, we have half an hour here to cover quite a lot of ground. So I'm going to invite uh, my colleagues just to say a few opening remarks each, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions from the audience. We've also had some questions come in online from social media this morning. My first guest is John MacArthur, Senior Fellow, United Nations Foundation. And let's get the ball rolling. Are the 17 SDGs a fitting successor to the Millennium Development Goals? Well, I consider it the first point is the outcome of the most inclusive global agenda setting process the world has ever seen. So in a sense, uh, the debate has been had, the debate has been completed, and we now have the outcome that the world has come up with. So uh, in that sense, it's very fitting because it's got the legitimacy of this incredibly inclusive process. The second thing I would say is that the Millennium Goals were really uh, addressing the problems as the world felt them uh, in tackling extreme poverty around 1999. Uh, at that point, you had the poorest parts of the world seeing the least progress for a generation, and this was really about shifting the super tanker to pay attention and to dedicate resources to improving lives, not just hoping growth would solve it all. And this was a very tense time in the global system. In 2015, we have to tackle the problems as they feel today and as we anticipate them for tomorrow. And that's not just extreme poverty, that's also issues of uh, social inclusion in every country of the world. And crucially, it's the part that I would say the Millennium Goals were weakest on, it's the environment, it's the natural capital, it's the oceans, it's the, uh, the climate, of course, it's the biodiversity, it's all these things that the world hasn't really got itself wired enough uh, to do yet, but are not just nice-to-haves, but need-to-haves for a successful society. So I think they're fitting. There's not a single person in the world probably who would have written them exactly as they're written in final form. But the beauty is that millions of people have been involved to come up with them as they are written, and that's what we get to work with for a generation. John, just saying that very briefly, are we starting these goals from a position of strength, you know, having concluded with a mixed scorecard, the MDGs that were kicked off 15 years ago? You've got to go issue by issue to answer that question. And I think one of the big things we have to realize is that nothing is monolithic in this world. So the global health revolution, in my view, is uh, the greatest success story of the Millennium Goals. Uh, by my rough estimate, at least 15 million people are alive today who wouldn't have been on previous trajectories. This is real numbers. Uh, but we have other issues uh, like education where we did pretty well with primary education, but we realized, well, we should be measuring learning and why aren't we dealing with secondary education? Why not tertiary education? And then we have these new areas I would put like clean energy, uh, oceans, uh, again, uh, climate, <laughs> which is uh, issue number one for the next several weeks uh, and several years. We don't even have the institutions set up yet to tackle the problem let alone the ways often even to measure what we're trying to uh, see happen. So this is uh, a mixed set of stories where they're, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants in some areas and uh, we've got to uh, you know, grow the giants in others. Thanks. Uh, David Victor, you are the, uh, a professor of the University of California, San Diego. Um, you've written in the past, I was reading this morning, on the gridlock that can sometimes be um, uh, can occur around multilateral uh, negotiations and the, the diplomacy that's involved in trying to pull together treaties with uh, over 170, 190 countries. What's your view on the success uh, prospects of the SDGs? Well, I think that's what's so interesting is that not only, as John said, we have an inclusive process that's produced these goals and now a process for producing indicators to measure the goals, but unlike in many other areas of international policy, and frankly also in government and national governments, that process moved with incre incredible speed and did not produce gridlock. 
So I think it's actually pretty extraordinary. I think it's going to be very easy for people to be critical of this, of the goals. Uh, it's going to be very easy for people to raise questions, as they should, about the measurement and the indicators. It's going to be very easy for people to say, my god, there's so many different goals and so many indicators, uh, more than 100 indicators, that uh, it's going to be hard for countries to kind of see straight and figure out what their, what their own priorities are. And those are all reasonable criticisms, and they're criticisms that will play out in this process of, of implementation. But when you take a step back from the process, it's pretty remarkable precisely because it's avoided gridlock. And I think part of what's going on here is that the diplomatic community has become more skilled at learning how to make the intergovernmental bargaining process useful where it can be useful. And so avoiding areas of gridlock. You'll see the same thing on display in Paris in the ne next few weeks, where I think what, what we're going to see is, for the first time in 18 years, a major intergovernmental agreement on climate change. So countries are going to come to a to one of these big negotiations and not leave with failure. And, and that's, that reflects skill, you know, real improvement in skill uh, uh, in negotiating and, and knowing where the intergovernmental process can, can make contributions and where it can't. And just stay on this process, if it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing achievement to get where we are, what's the best place to, to kick off? How would, you, how would you begin the process now of actually implementing and executing on the goal? Well, I think the, the indicators are going to be crucial. Um, some of them are pretty straightforward and basically building on things we already measure. Many of them are not, so it's going to be very hard. And there's going to be a tension between treating problems holistically, putting them all together and talking about the world's general problems as a single bucket. There's going to be a tension between that and focusing in in very practical ways on specific things. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at history of the last three decades, international environmental law started by focusing on very specific things, wetlands degradation, trade in endangered species, and actually made a tremendous amount of progress by being very specific. And we've swung in the last few decades towards these more holistic systems. And frankly, the holistic systems are often producing gridlock, and that's the problem. And so I, I think it's going to be crucial that as we start to really measure the elements of these goals, that then countries and organizations figure out practically what are we actually going to do to deliver on these goals and be very specific about that. Thank you. John Beard, Director of the Department of Aging and Life Course at the World Health Organization. So specifically, health is one goal, but also you're involved in, in the, the GAC on aging as well, I should add. So you'll probably have insight from there. But let's focus on your core competency, the, the aging. Um, part of a portion of the, of, the, of, the, of the population. How well served are they by these goals? Pretty well. Um, I, I, first of all, I'd have to agree with both John and David that I think this has been an incredibly inclusive process and it's almost a miracle that we've reached a global consensus so quickly. Um, and also, I, I think the fact that this global consensus does take this holistic perspective, which is quite aspirational, but then the question is, how do you hone down and, and, and into it being something that drives effective action? Um, in terms of older people uh, and the process of getting here, I think it was a hard slog to get people to understand that older people actually are part of the global community and they need to be included in goals as they're set. And it's particularly heartening that a lot of the goals are quite specific in their wording, uh, particularly the goal around health, uh, health at all ages. Uh, and while that's not specific in terms of what it means, and I think now the challenge does move to what are the indicators going to be in terms of how we move forward, it does create the space for action to ensure that people of all ages uh, can benefit from, from sustainable development and that we don't have the discriminatory approaches that have happened in the past. Um, I think from a health perspective, uh, we have a beast that's very different from the Millennium Development Goals where they were very focused and very clear um, uh, outcomes we were targeting. Uh, I think now we talk more about the idea of universal coverage and ensuring that everybody has access to the, the health services and the, and the other um, public health initiatives that are necessary to maintain their health. Being able to identify what in that broad gamut we should be focusing on, I think, will be the next challenge. Okay. Of course, you, um, the, the paper that the Council put out recently on ageing was talking about the economic opportunity. And, and how well recognised is that in the wide in the business world, for example? I think people are just starting to understand the contribution that older people make to society. Uh, traditionally, we've tended to stereotype them as a burden and looked at expenditure on older populations as being a cost. Uh, these days, I think people are starting to realise it's much better con considered as an investment. 
And if you make that investment, you start thinking about, well, what would be the return on that investment? And uh, older people make incredible contributions, so the return can be fostering those contributions, whether it be supporting families informally, informal care and support, or participation in the workforce, or even as consumers and creative people who contribute to society in broader ways. So thinking about how we can make that investment, I think, is the next shift. I don't think that most people have finally got to that point, but I, I think the door is opening and there's certainly a lot of focus. But unfortunately, to date, it's mainly been, oh my goodness, we've got this tsunami of older people. How are we going to be able to afford economic, uh, sorry, avoid economic disaster? So I think there's a long way to go, but I think people are starting to, to reframe the way they look at it. John, back to you and back to the, back to the, back to the goals. What's going to be keeping you up at, uh, at night? What are you going to be worrying about, about getting, getting the implementation phase going? I think the first thing is just explaining them. You know, I've been, in the past several weeks since these were agreed diplomatically and then formally by presidents and prime ministers, uh, I have found myself coming back to a few basic points to, to get the message of what they actually are. You know, first, they're a set of norms, they're a set of north stars. That's all they are. Uh, they're not uh, an implementation mechanism. Uh, they're ultimately open source for the world to figure out how they write the story. Uh, and the UN has played an important role, a, a unique role that only it can play to uh, convene this conversation. But now this is about not you know, governments and NGOs uh, on their own. This is about science. This is about uh, you know, the business community. This is about uh, what I would call the second half of society that has to be part of this conversation. Uh, but the other thing I would say is that this, this notion of the number of goals is very important because, uh, if, if I may just tell a quick vignette, when I first uh, saw these goals get agreed as the 17 and the 169 targets, I called my mother uh, that night back home in uh, Canada and I said, wow, mom, you know, these goals that I've been talking about, she's retired, you know, doesn't really know what I do f uh, with my days, but very supportive. <laughs> she said, the end of extreme poverty, they said, all these ambitious targets, it's quite incredible. She said, that's great. I said, there's only one problem. So what's that? I said, there's 17 of them. I don't know how to explain them. And she said, 17, that's a great number. To which I kind of stood back, I said, why is that? She said, sounds like they didn't fake it. The world's complicated. And she said, if they'd come back with some Letterman style top 10, I probably wouldn't have believed them. And it was very interesting, because when I mentioned that story in a speech a few days later, everyone from the audience the next couple of days came back and said, oh, it's like your mom said, the world's complicated. And I think this notion of these goals recognizing complexity is a new concept for the world. Because we've been trying to boil down things that are simple in order to communicate them, but the reality is most people know the world is complicated. And I would even say, if you have 17 goals, most countries actually probably have at least 17 ministries. So are you saying that one goal per ministry is too many? I mean, these are the interesting types of questions. And how does each constituency organize itself to rally the business, the science, the government, the civil society? And the deepest reality is that you know, the, the people worried about non-communicable diseases are generally speaking not the same people who are worried about uh, clean energy systems. Those are different communities. And so how does each community, especially the ones that aren't used to thinking about these big global challenges, how do they set their own scientific agenda, uh, policy agenda, implementation agenda, financing agenda? I think that's the big question, is how do these communities that aren't used to organizing around these goals see their story as one to be written within it? Thank you. Now, fourth industrial revolution, we talk a lot about technology and the confluence of a dizzying array of, of, of uh, innovation and scientific endeavor all converging into a, uh, a, a present sometime in the near future that we don't really understand as yet. But how can this be harnessed and what are the major risks, David, in looking at the achievement of these goals? Well, I think, uh, I guess I'd say two things. First, I'm worried that the goals have been set very ambitiously and that we don't actually know which of them are achievable. I think one of the things that was very smart about the Millennium Development Goals is that although we didn't meet all of them, they were set in a way that they were stretch goals and they were connected. They were always anchored in what we thought was achievable, whereas the current round of goals, I think, may be outside that, that, that realm. The second thing I'd say is, is in the area of, that I do a lot of work, which is climate change, 
the potential to address the problem through the Industrial Revolution, through technological change, that's where the action is. So uh, in the last report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, one of the things we showed in that report was that you could reduce emissions growth a little bit through changes in behavior and better efficiency and things like that. But the only way you make big reductions, 50%, 80% reductions in emissions, that's what's necessary to stop the problem, is radical technological change. We need new kinds of electric power systems, new systems of transportation. Uh, and, and some of these new technologies might simply be new fuels that we drop into the existing system, like biofuels. But most of them are really going to be fundamental and profound changes. And I think that's the really big challenge here, is, is you're going to solve the climate problem and many other problems with technological change and policies that are supportive. But it, it's over many decades. And how do you send a credible signal to firms and to governments that this time is, we're actually serious, that even though we've been talking about problems of climate, other problems for decades, this time we're really serious and we need to start innovating and then deploying those technologies. That's the really, really difficult thing. That's what keeps me up at night. And how how, how uh, optimistic are you that that message is going to get heard? Well, the part, I think a lot of the, what will be interesting, particularly interesting test here will be Paris. Um, the sustainable development goals are so big and so ambitious that I don't think we're going to identify any single moment as the key test. Paris will be a very key test for climate because if diplomats go there, they adopt an agreement, and more importantly, they adopt a, a process for filling in all the things they can't agree on on the road to Paris, mm -hmm. or the road through Paris, as people are calling it now. If, if they do that, then that'll send a signal of credibility that has been missing for 18 years. Can I just add one point Please on this? Please do. One of the, I agree with so much of what David just said, but the flip side is I was very involved with the early days of the Millennium Goals and getting them off the ground. One of the things that I think is almost hard to remember is how people thought things were impossible back then. So the classic example was the AIDS pandemic and antiretroviral treatment. And I actually recently went back and looked at a lot of the memos, the internal documents from the UN, and it had these comments like, well, countries with high uh, HIV AIDS prevalence will never be able to tackle child mortality, so we should set their bar lower, because the expectations were very low. Well, that would have included countries like Ethiopia and Malawi that have now actually achieved the Millennium Development Goal for Child Mortality. And so the question I ask myself is, which are the things that we presume today are too hard to do, but actually are doable? And which are the things that the systems uh, need to actually just be rewired or relaunched or launched fresh? And it's not to uh, understate the scope of the challenge on something like the technology transformations for climate, which are enormous. But I think one of the questions we really need to ask ourselves is, you know, it was official statements, official uh, policy in early 2001 that it was just too hard to try to deliver antiretrovirals. So why bother? Now this is seen as an easy problem, relatively speaking, and the hard problem is you know, non-communicable diseases and things. And so what's the, what's the cascade effect that might start a new set of conversations for these new goals with new issues, new agenda? I think that's, for me, the, the single biggest question. What are these, these triggers that might kickstart a whole new set of processes? Because societies learn in sequence more than in parallel a lot of the time. So John, I agree, and I have to say I really like your mother. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the idea that she, she, can, yeah, she can grasp complexity and the idea that these are, are complex challenges. I think in the past we've been looking for very simple solutions, um, but really if we're going to, I mean, if I look at my own field, health, uh, it's, uh, it's relatively simple to put in place a program to tackle a specific condition. But to try and build the complex system that can respond to different conditions as they present and, and evolve and change um, is, is quite a different matter. Uh, and, I, and, and I take your message that that may appear challenging today, but it's only by saying, OK, we're going to accept that this is a complex challenge. We need to have a complex response. Now let's think about how we do it. And then maybe in 10 years' time, 15 years' time, we'll be looking back and we'll say, well, gee, you know, it actually wasn't as hard as we thought it was going to be. But instead of starting with an overly simplistic approach, at least re recognising the complexity which is confronting us, I think is, is you know, a, a good starting point. And then, and then I think um, 
if we look at the fourth industrial revolution and the opportunities for technology to be able to start us to help build those complex solutions. And, and also, I think, what is often forgotten is the ability it gives poorer countries to leapfrog, to not necessarily go through all the same phases that other countries have had to, to go through to get to a certain point, but to leapfrog with new and innovative complex solutions. I think it's really exciting. But it's only by setting ourselves that challenge that we'll be able to, to, to really focus energy and, and effort. So, John, on that note, Please do. I'm quite, I'm quite keen, because we talked about environments, I'm quite keen to see where John thinks innovation can, can, can play a role outside of that area, but please, David, go ahead. I just want to add the, this industrial revolution that's underway. We focus a lot on the innovations that can solve problems, and that's, I think, exactly right, and we're going to talk some more about this. I think we should also remember that there are tremendous innovations underway in terms of measurement mm -hmm. and data. And so if we think one of the things that's going to be very hard about this complex problem is not only explaining the complexity to people, and people get it, they understand the life's complex, but then also developing indicators, what's really new now is the capacity to massively decentralize some of the monitoring, massively decentralize the assessment and the process of figuring out which of these indicators we want to measure and which add up to different kinds of priorities in different settings. And I think that's really different now. The, 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 the sensors that are available and the capacity of people, even graduate students, undergraduates, to go get all the data that used to be concentrated in the hands of census offices and governments, that's really quite different. It's, it's for example, one of the reasons we discovered this problem with Volkswagen was the capacity of independent analysts to go off and look at the data and say, something's wrong with the actual on-road on, on performance of these vehicles. Yeah, I would just say I think that I only agree with what David just said. I think there is the, the kind of classic technology <laughs> or scientific breakthroughs that are needed in many areas, and energy systems are the most glaring. You know, we need to rewire everything in a sense. Uh, there are things that are more the applied technologies, like the cell phones of the world, which uh, in my personal experience are roughly like antiretrovirals in terms of how they change the world in ways none of us most of us really anticipated. The fact that I can read email in pretty much any corner of the globe today still blows my mind, because I remember even 2005, being in a lot of places in Africa, that was just not possible. So then there's these questions of things like even uh, digital financial transfers, that not necessarily Bitcoin, but that could be a new world. But uh, you know, we could be providing basic income support to every human being on the planet through uh, some small uh, device uh, within a very short amount of time. So the notion of ending extreme poverty might end up being actually a technicality. I, I did a quick calculation. That works out to roughly 0.1% of the rich world national income. This is your total income. This is a very cheap proposition, but it's a technology design question. But, but the other big piece, I think, is that, like in the data sphere, there are probably new forms of social organization that are going to be required for this. In some cases, that's going to be corporate entities. In some cases, that'll be new forms of governance, uh, new forms of feedback loops for governance. So if you have some, loosely speaking, big data uh, algorithm providing feedback to government and you have citizen input on that data or generation of that data, you know, the notion of which, gov which decisions a minister takes could be entirely different and which decisions a company takes could be entirely different, and how one regulates the decisions that are required by governments versus companies versus the independent analysts who are there to verify. So I think these are some of the, you know, in a sense, most, again, complex, but also most exciting questions because the beauty of uh, a seven billion going to eight billion person world where it's very clear that no single entity is in charge is that the sources of innovation and actually inspiration are quite diffuse. So the ability for new solutions, either localized or globalized, to come from anywhere, I think is something, again, we haven't even got our heads around how big an opportunity that is. Well, look, time is marching on. It's always a great shame because we could be here for, for the entire afternoon. But let's just talk about the immediate 12, next 12 months, and maybe think about what we'd like to see, if we could see one thing achieved on the path to achieving this magical number of 17 sustainable development goals. John. Oh, me first. John B. My goodness, yeah. <laughs> um, 
I mean, I think it comes down to the question of indicators and really being d deciding what the focus is going to be. Because even though we're talking about complexity, there has to be some focus within that. Um, in the field of health, that's a, a very challenging area. We have a lot of competing interests and a, and a lot of uh, specific outcomes we'd like to be encouraging. So trying to look, I think, at a, uh, an indicator which really gives us uh, uh, a good handle on whether we're building the systems that are appropriate to meet the needs that which are the current needs and the emerging needs which will come over the next 15 years. I think that would be the the first uh, the first thing I'd be looking for. And John, just on that, and I, and I should really have, have, have mentioned this, for, for the benefit of our audience, many of whom are from this region. Are there any particular specific strategies for the Middle East, North Africa region, or any 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 nuances on on your approach to aging that we should be mindful of, and perhaps our audience might find interesting. Well, in terms of ageing rather than health, um, I think the, the challenges are, are fairly universal, but uh, perhaps in this region there are, there are real issues, uh, gender issues for older women. Um, I think one of the things we've been talking about, is, which you touched on but we haven't really talked about, is the, what are the risks associated with the fourth uh, industrial revolution? And, uh, and one of the, the big risks is um, uh, people who will be left behind. Uh, and particularly there, I'm thinking of people who have a level of illiteracy or computer illiteracy. And so it's easy to talk about, well, the money might come through a mobile phone, but people actually have to have the skills to be able to accept it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, I think particularly in rural areas and in poorer areas of the world, uh, so here I'm, I'm thinking of North Africa, uh, that, uh, uh, the, the, and particularly for women, there's a level of, of uh, a l more limited level of literacy, which might mean that the opportunities are harder to seize. Um, but more broadly, I think uh, it, it surprises some people that ageing is a global trend. Um, in this region, in, for example, in, by 2050, Iran will have a population structure that's almost the same as Japan has today. Uh, and yet it's going to go through that transition in a much, much more rapid, uh, uh, shorter time. Uh, and so putting in place the, the, the things that are necessary to respond, they, they have to actually start thinking now. So I think for the region, the, the, the pressure is on them to be uh, really responding urgently. Thank you. David, next 12 months, what's your priority? We discuss indicators. I think the indicator is going to be important. I suspect that at the end of 12 months, there's still going to be some that we don't know how to measure. What I'm going to be looking for is whether a handful of governments and international organizations like development banks have come forward and said, here's how we're going to use the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that so many countries agree to this so quickly, and I'm also worried about that, because that could also be a sign that countries aren't intending to take it seriously. And you're not going to get that through a UN resolution. You're going to get that through real countries, development programs, banks, you know, real organizations saying, OK, here's, here are the ones we're going to put a special priority on. Here's what, how we're going to use them, kind of demonstrating that practicality. Do you think business is playing a role? Should it play a role? Yeah, I think business is watching this. Business is always looking to see what's credible and what's not credible because there's an almost infinite supply of resolutions and ideas and a much smaller real supply of things that are going to get traction. I think business is looking to see which of these get traction. John McArthur, your th closing thoughts on the year ahead. I guess two things. When I look at the countries, and uh, I'd look at countries like Nigeria and uh, my home country, Canada, which, you know, Nigeria has been one of the leaders of implementing the MDGs at a policy level. So how does it take on this next challenge? But it's a universal agenda. So how does a country like Canada that is looking at a lot of these same issues in a, a modern, in an advanced economy form, how does it think this through? But the second thing I'm going to look for globally, if I could have one thing on my wish list for the first stage of this, it's a proper global fund or global instrument for education, where I would argue the central uh, metric should be universal access for girls to secondary education. I think that is a tip of the spear issue. I think the world is ready for it. I think the politics of uh, people understanding uh, Malala are, are very powerful. But I think also uh, this is a, a technical policy community that's taken a few years to get organized. And now Gordon Brown's chairing a big global commission on financing education. And uh, I think this has the ingredients to be a breakthrough for the skills revolution, not, not complete, but a breakthrough uh, that can help deal with a lot of these issues of how do we make sure that we've really got every part of the world getting access to the, the types of skills it needs. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you to our audience watching online. Thank you for joining me here on the panel. It's been a fascinating session. I wish you a successful summit. This thank session so is much. now closed. <laughs>